mediation? How have these methods developed over the years? And how also digital tools have been have become part of the toolbox uh, in doing that work? So over to you, Villa. You have a few minutes. Thanks, Johanna, and, and good afternoon, uh, uh, everyone. Um, so, uh, uh, Foresight Matters have been part of the uh, uh, CMI toolbox for, for more than 10 years. And, uh, and I would say that uh, uh, with these methods, uh, uh, rather than trying to provide something very new uh, uh, in CMI program, at the end of the day, I feel that we have uh, uh, tried to find a ways to strengthen uh, the, uh, uh, some of the fundamental elements which are anyway in, in CMI and six ways to, to improve the program from those perspectives. And uh, as you mentioned, uh, there are two different elements, and I would actually uh, add one, which are critical in CMI program and also uh, uh, in, in this work. So certainly, uh, first one is a future orientation. Uh, second one is uh, participation. And the third one is, uh, is uh, digital technologies. And uh, looking at the future orientation, I think that it has been there uh, in the CMI DNA uh, since the uh, beginning. Uh, last fall, we had a, a, a lot of discussions and the seminars around the uh, uh, legacy of, uh, of late President Ahtisaari uh, uh, after his, uh, uh, him passing away. And uh, I think the one uh, element which came from the discussions very clearly uh, was his uh, pragmatic optimism and the idea that uh, 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 when you're trying to find a solution, you don't find that from the past and history, but you actually find that from the future. And I think that that has been the, one of the guiding principles in CMI uh, uh, all the time. And when you're looking at the CMI's work, uh, most of the time we are looking at the future, vision building, what happens next, um, and, uh, and how we can make a better future. And I think that uh, uh, that's a, a common denominator for, for all of CMI work, and uh, uh, certainly in the focus of the, of the uh, foresight methods as well. The second element on the participation, uh, that's also uh, in the DNA of, of, of CMI. And uh, in this field, uh, this is a very distinctive field that uh, I think that uh, how, what's, what's our logic of the world is that in many other organizations, a uh, uh, logic of the work that uh, you find a topic uh, that you feel that it's interesting, important, and then you start to find the people uh, who uh, uh, think the same or somehow crucial around the what comes to the topic that you feel important. But in CMI, I think the logic is different. Um, how we work is that actually we are uh, looking for people that we feel that are relevant or important from different perspectives. And then with these people, we only, after that, look at what are the topics that interest these people. So that's a, a bit different way of, of, of participation. And I think that that's the logic uh, which I think we try to strengthen with these uh, methods as well. And the third element which is there, uh, I would say that is the curiosity to look at how the digital technologies are changing at the conflict landscape and how you can uh, look at these uh, technologies not only from the perspective of challenges, but also opportunities. And uh, I think this has been there uh, since the uh, beginning of CMI. And also in the early years, there was a pilot on, on, on how that time uh, new technologies would change the landscape. And now I think that since then, uh, that has been part of the discussion inside the CMI always. And um, looking at these methods, uh, I think what has been very clear from the beginning that, uh, of course, they have been thinking on, 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 on uh, uh, how to use these methods, uh, how we can translate the method developed elsewhere to serve the purpose in, in CMI's work, and especially in the, uh, in the field where um, there's no consensus that, uh, that actually <laughs> what, what the future uh, will and should be. Uh, but I think the very practical approach has been that rather than only thinking, we have been 
testing a lot, trying different ways, and actually work with our our friends and partners in different countries to to explore on how these methods uh, 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 could improve our mutual work. And I'm very glad that uh, uh, last year and, and the year before we were uh, able to work with uh, with Andreas as well to reflect a bit on on what what is the lessons learned and what uh, how how these methods are actually uh, have been and could improve uh, the uh, uh, the practice of peacemaking. So I'm very uh, very glad that we have uh, had the opportunity to have the reflection. I'm really glad to. Glad to have this discussion today on, on this topic. Thank you very much. And thank you so much, Ville. And also your words really clearly put forward how the use of foresight in CMI's work is not maybe your traditional association of, you know, we're trying to predict conflicts, but it is more about talking about future, conceptualizing about future as part of peacemaking. And, and also thank you for bring, building the perfect segue to Andreas. Uh, who indeed um, was the lead scholar in a study that looked at CMI's use of digital tools in forward-looking dialogues, particularly in the cases of Libya and Yemen. Uh, so Andreas, if you could share some of the key insights and conclusions from that study and, and relevant pointers from your academic uh, perspective, over to you. Thank you, Johanna. And it's, uh, it's a pleasure to contribute to this important uh, conversation. And it's been of course, also a pleasure to, to work with all of you at CMI over the past um, a couple of years on, on this research. So uh, we started out really with the observation, um, and I'm working a lot on, on digitalization of, of peacemaking and peace building more broadly speaking. We, we started out with the observation that digital technologies and, and computer-based methods are, are often used to, um, to generate more information and more evidence about the world. Um, you know, today, so, through, for instance, Earth observations, online surveys, or, or crunching uh, social media data. Um, um, and very often, I think we can think about this as enabling what I call kind of a sincere approach um, or, or a sincere attitude, um, um, making sense of the world as accurately as possible. But uh, as as Villa said uh, at CMI, the focus is very much uh, on uh, on on the future and uh, on um, on, um, on on paving out a, a path towards um, a more peaceful uh, future. And when it comes to that, it's really important to not only have an accurate view uh, on the world, so not only a sincere view, uh, but also really uh, go beyond um, beyond facts um, and think about how uh, the world. Uh, should be and could be. And this is what I'm referring to as kind of a, a subjunctive use uh, of technology that enables a subjunctive um, attitude. So in the in the paper that we have published, and I do hope that somebody will be able to share uh, the link in the chat, uh, we are using this distinction uh, between the sincere and the subjunctive to, to make sense uh, of, of CMI's methods and to understand how, in fact, uh, they enable um, a kind of um, a dialogue towards uh, towards um, um, the future, um, and uh, as as I said in the, in the or as you said, Johanna, in the in the paper, there are two uh, distinct case studies. So I would encourage everyone to to have a detailed look uh, uh, at them. I, I won't be able to in the in the short period of time that I have here to um, uh, share share them in great detail. But I do want to share my uh, screen briefly, um, if I can, and and just share one uh, chart uh, from from the paper. So I'm trying uh, to share the screen. I do hope you will see uh, now uh, my screen. Um, and this is uh, just to say, this is one of the methods that I think CMI have been uh, developing over um, the past, um, I guess, 10 years or so. They were, um, we, we did a review of, of how this method has evolved and there were earlier versions of that. This is uh, currently the way um, I think it is currently used in, in, in dialogue settings. It's called the prioritization exercise and, and the tool has been created uh, by the colleagues at, at INCLUS. And if you look at this chart, so this has been produced through um, in, a, in a dialogue context uh, through um, uh, the use of survey data. And I can see quite clearly here how it has uh, both kind of sincere and subjunctive uh, features. It is sincere because it is based on, on survey data. Uh, the participants that have submitted this data really kind of sincerely, honestly make an assessment uh, of, of their own opinions. In this case, it is about 
uh, the Yemen war economy and to what degree this issue of the war economy has been uh, addressed and to what degree addressing this issue is important uh, for peacemaking in Yemen. So the participants really, you know, make a sincere um, assessment of, of that issue. And um, the, the, um, the method also allows, for instance, to differentiate between different uh, demographic groups uh, and enables a comparison between them. So you can see, for instance, in this chart, uh, the black dots on the left top, uh, you'll see that as uh, civil society and uh, their opinions is quite diametrically opposed or their assessments are quite diametrically opposed to the assessments uh, of, of uh, the participants who are uh, associated with uh, with government. And that's a very, you know, uh, clear kind of realistic uh, view on on the on, on these different uh, participants in in, in the dialogue. Um, now, um, you know, having these kind of realistic views uh, can be important uh, for, for the dialogue to identify different uh, positions, for instance, but it can also lead to um, kind of a stalemates if, if there's no clear way forward, um, um, you know, no clear pathway to, to really reconcile these different positions or to move away from, from these antagonistic views. Uh, but if you look at the chart, you'll also see that I think there are some subjunctive uh, features in this uh, particular chart and in this particular method. So for instance, the big uh, blue dot in the middle uh, where it says war economy, that's the aggregate value of all assessments. And if facilitators, and they can do that, only display this particular aggregate value, um, then they are creating a bit of an ambivalence where uh, the differences between the individual participants is not visible anymore, right? And that can be, you know, helpful in the in the facilitation. And uh, another feature, for instance, that's in this chart is that you have this kind of, um, you know, square logic uh, where you have uh, the the dots, the the data points uh, lined up according to importance and and. Um, to what degree they have been addressed. And just through that kind of a visual design, um, um, the chart enables a future-oriented conversation because obviously the conversation will be about, okay, what now is, what has to be done? What is what is most important? And you can see that uh, these designs are used in a variety of ways across, across uh, CMI's um, uh, interventions. So just to maybe conclude, I think I really, you know, we cannot... Uh, while obviously there are a lot of innovations in, in digital technology, uh, particularly also for the use of artificial intelligence, um, sometimes we have the illusion that we can really predict the future, but uh, that you kind of sincerely understand what will happen. Uh, but of course, that is not at all what peacemaking is about. Peacemaking is about shaping the future. And I think uh, using these two um, uh, views on technology affordances as subjunctive and sincere and thinking about how a combination of the two is necessary to kind of bring the, the dialogue and the peace process forward is, is maybe a, is a good um, entry point. So thank you so much. Thank you so much, Andreas. It's a great distinction and very clarifying one about exploring the world as it is and exploring the world as it could be. And uh, so, so very useful that you showed this visualization as we talk about these digital approaches that we have used in, in forward-looking dialogues. That was a concrete case, what it looks like. So it's the platform where participants uh, submit their inputs and then they are collectively projected to them and they see where uh, specific inputs are kind of in relation to one another, where they land, what are certain issues that maybe then uh, can be read as priorities and the like. So that was also very useful in kind of showing that in practice. Thank you so much. Then moving on to Edgar, um, you were part of a forward-looking dialogue process um, that was done more recently in Armenia last year. Uh, so it would be great to hear a bit more of your experiences of it uh, in terms of the value added as you found it, uh, how did it fit it to the context of Armenia, um, and also specifically on the digital methods that were used. This same platform, Inclus, was used there. So if you can share, share a little bit about your, your experiences and impressions, over to you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Joanna. Now, frankly speaking, um, I will have a rather um, a consumer view on, on, on the topic. Um, interestingly, I had an experience of working with both digital methods and the digital tool uh, uh, created by CMI or uh, inspired by CMI. 
Um, I had a chance, I've been part of a group uh, consisting of civil society actors, uh, parliament members, government representatives uh, that participated in scenario building workshop uh, organized by your colleague, uh, Haik Toroyan in Armenia. And um, I liked the process because uh, I liked it very much actually. Uh, because um, it was really future oriented, uh, it was participatory, and uh, it was uh, done with the use of, with the best use of digital modern technologies. Um, and um, I don't know uh, if if our audience knows uh, about the context. Uh, we are in Armenia. We have a numbers of internal and external uh, conflicts, so for us it was very important to to have a chance uh, to think uh, about possible uh, scenarios, political scenarios, uh, internal uh, and external ones. That was done in a dialogical process, in a process of dialogue uh, between the civil society actors, parliament uh, members, and, and government representatives. And um, I don't know much about the philosophy and the intentions of CMI, but I can share like my uh, vision, my my emotions uh, on the process. Uh, it it was really very helpful. Uh, because it creates a, a space for you to think further. I mean, to to try to um, think, you know, what kind of developments are uh, one can expect, what are the likely scenarios, and and how to uh, mitigate the possible risks, and, and and so on and so forth. So from that point of view, I think uh, I, I see the um, special value of such a future-oriented approach. And interestingly, uh, during that work, we used also INCLUSE as a, as a digital tool. Um, and um, what, can I, what, what I can say about the INCLUSE uh, as a tool, it's a kind of, it's a perfect combination of, um, of an analytical tool uh, that also provides uh, a lot of opportunities to visually see the outcomes of your analysis. And uh, by the way, at this moment, at this very moment, uh, again, with uh, participation of uh, our CMI, par like partners from CMI, we use uh, INCLUS for, uh, an for analyzing of uh, another uh, assessment, uh, assessment that we are doing, like Peace Dialog is doing at the moment. Uh, we try to assess the needs of uh, conflict affected population of Armenia uh, for, uh, for further developing a, a kind of uh, civil society version of the Armenian Azerbaijani Peace Treaty. So we, we try to understand the needs of the Armenian population. And by the way, in parallel to this process, our Azerbaijani colleagues are doing the same. So um, we, we intend to use INCLUSE also to do a, 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 a comparative analysis of, of the data that we, we will receive. Um, so at this moment, we have um, the data only from Armenia. And now we are working on the report. Uh, but again, I mean, uh, coming back to the um, tool, uh, it's a perfect tool. I mean, there are many tools. I mean, we know that there are many um, tools for analysis. But um, uh, what is so special with uh, INCLUSE is that it uh, it's a good way to, to get like the, the information systematized in a way and also um, visualized. Um, I think this is it for the moment, and uh, I will be open for like any questions regarding like our experience of of using uh, like CMI's approach and CMI's uh, tools. Yeah, and thank you for for having me here. Thank you, Edgar. It's really helpful. So 
um, the example that you referenced was very clear in line with what Ville was talking about, inclusion. Uh, so it's also like the settings where these conversations have been had that do often comprise of very diverse perspectives from political, from civil society and the like. And I think you already got us started of this conversation a really zooming into what is the value added of foresight methodology, but also these digital methods. So maybe we can, in this panel discussion now, uh, just to kind of dive into it a little bit deeper. I think Edgar, you got us started. If we talk about foresight, you felt that it created the space to really think and talk about future, really assess also the risks, the possible scenarios. Any, any other thoughts, reflections on this? What is the particular value added of foresight approaches to peacemaking, which is inherently often forward looking. Um, Andrea Soville, is there anything that you would like to add or Edgar that you would like to further highlight? Feel free to just raise your hat. Ville, go ahead. Thanks. Uh, uh, I think that the uh, uh, the benefits of, of, of using the foresight methods and, and even the uh, digitally assisted methods I think that, um, uh, of course, in different cases, they are different, but uh, maybe a common denominator for, for all the conflicts is that uh, that uh, uh, when the, uh, uh, in conflicts, many times the uncertainty increases. And uh, we tend to look at, be more and more short-sighted, why we should actually be more uh, forward-looking. And... At uh, the very minimum, uh, using different kind of methods helps the facilitator, helps uh, the process to actually continuously reorient it uh, to, the, um, uh, to the future. Because uh, everyone who knows uh, this field uh, knows that uh, if you don't facilitate the discussion, you end up on discussing on the history and the things that you cannot change. And it's, it's uh, you continuously have to adjust uh, the discussion to the uh, to the future. So I think that these kind of methods, I think that are ways to uh, 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 guide the discussion on 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 that direction uh, continuously. Then I think that the second element, uh, uh, which uh, I think that is there, is that um, in this field there's always um, uh, elements of uh, constructive vagueness. So how to how to work in this field is to avoid the things that uh, uh, cannot be set and uh, and uh, and leave the constructive vagueness to the uh, zones where you know that uh, 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 you won't end up on on a good situation in the, in, in the current uh, current moment but at the same time i think that uh, it, it shouldn't mean that everything should be chaotic but actually, ninety-five percent of the things are clear, <laughs> and uh, I think that the again, uh, uh, this this kind of approaches is a good way to to actually uh, uh, focus on the thinking uh, on the issues which are and should be clear. Uh, try to find a, a facts facts that you can agree, <laughs> and build the grounds on on the, on the points that uh, actually you can achieve uh, consensus very easily. And on the other hand, I think there's maybe hope that this, uh, using uh, the terminology with, uh, uh, provided by Andres, this would then lead to actually um, uh, uh, have the uh, uh, more subjunctive uh, discussions as well, that uh, after laying down the facts, you can actually then concentrate on, on, on the world, how it should be. So this is maybe a couple of uh, elements that future-oriented uh, 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 more systematic approach on future orientation and uh, dividing the things on a bit on the on the things that you can discuss and cannot discuss. Thanks. Thanks. Um, Andreas, would you like to add something? Yeah, I, th I don't think I don't have much to add. Uh, everything that Villa said was very uh, important and, and meaningful. Um, maybe just to say that uh, so in, in the paper, uh, we are also discussing to some degree uh, this question of whether epistemic certainty can can ever be achieved and and there's actually another article that's referenced in the paper uh, on this and uh, I think when it comes to digitalization of, of peacemaking really we have seen this you know drive towards data and evidence 
based methods. And there's almost kind of, I think, um, don't quote me on this, but I think of it was a terror of epistem ep epistemic certainty, um, as in everyone tries to know as accurately as possible what's going on. And we see time and again in conflict contexts that it's really, really impossible to do that. It is important to do it, but it's impossible to kind of finish that task. Um, and on top of that, apart from knowing how the world is, is there's, you know, there is um, this normative uncertainty. What, you know, what do you really want to do? Uh, what as a conflict stakeholder, as a party, uh, as, a, as a mediator? And uh, and very often there are also these antagonisms that prevent uh, any any uh, solution, obviously, just based on facts. And therefore, uh, future oriented methods do come in, I think, almost kind of uh, as creating this kind of segue uh, out of that uh, constellation. Um, yeah. And maybe Edgar, as you're adding anything, it would be also interesting to hear your perspectives on the limitations. <laughs> of course, we talked now a lot about the value added and where this useful for, but what are maybe the limitations of of using foresight that uh, that you have seen or could think of? Thanks. It's a difficult question, actually. Uh, so I, I was going to talk a bit uh, about the strategizing potential. Uh, of the approach uh, because um, from the strategic point of view, I mean, it's so important, you know, to, to develop a kind of a vision of, of, of a future, a joint vision of a future, or to try to understand what, what kind of possible scenarios they are, what, what, are the, what, what kind of scenarios are available, what are the um, driving forces for each type of development. And from that point of view, it's like you cannot do any strategic process without being able to see that developments. So from that point of view, I mean, as a, as a civil society actor, I mean, if, if you want to do strategic action, not just move chaotically. So for, for us, it was very important aspect. So this is one of the most important aspects uh, for me. When it comes to, um, I don't know, shortcomings or problems, I don't know, of course, you cannot do a perfect forecast of the future. And I think, I believe that the methodology is not about uh, forecasting. I mean, it's not about uh, thinking of uh, um, most likely scenarios, but it is more about understanding like what kind of risks they are. What like to identify the real risks and uh, to to identify also the strategies to mitigate those risks. So uh, and um, I believe that methodology gives all opportunities. I mean, it's, the methodology is capable of doing that, and that it creates a lot of possibilities also for the involved actors to think on that level, to think on on a strategic level. Um, so this is uh, what I wanted to add. That's very, very helpful and clear. Um, on the limitations, Villo, Andreas, did you want to add anything uh, when it comes to the four science approaches as a whole? I mean, just very briefly, maybe overall, I mean, I think the challenge, of course, is that uh, with all digital methods, you know, the work has to be done in, in the end, not only virtually, but in, in practice. And I think this is where... Uh, a, a lot of work that CMI does is very valuable in getting conflict stakeholders to do exactly that. We, we have seen that uh, um, the, a lot of emphasis is put on concrete outputs that are generated, letters, advocacy work, um, uh, plans of action, etc. But then there are so many other context factors that, of course, then come in. So in a sense, I think it's also quite important to, uh, you know, to really be realistic also. Uh, maybe sincere <laughs> when it comes to also communicating what can and cannot be done with these kind of methods. Yeah, I I, I fully agree on that, and uh, I think that uh, uh, even though we can improve the approach, uh, I think that we cannot uh, hide the fundament hide from the fundaments which are always in in, in uh, uh, present in the peace process. That uh, especially at the beginning. Uh, of, of 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 engagement, uh, uh, I think that uh, good negotiators, good politicians, are good in uh, presenting their opinions as facts. 
and that's a, that's a, that's a, a quality of, of of a good politician. But I think that uh, uh, when uh, uh, you start to engage in the process, you actually have to be more humble and and try to uh, and find a platform where you can actually agree that uh, that you have facts that you can agree and you have uh, opinions uh, uh, visions uh, uh, views which are actually more personal more uh, 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 subjective and uh, and uh, i think that um, uh, getting to the point where where you actually uh, understand that uh, this is the case and and trust the other <laughs> And the others that uh, uh, that uh, uh, on on other sides, you have the same uh, uh, structure. Uh, I think that it requires uh, much more than a dig digital technologies, but that that actually requires a lot of uh, humanization of the of the uh, aspects. And I would say that uh, maybe a best uh, one of the lessons learned that we have had in 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 CMI that uh, maybe at the beginning. Uh, uh, when we started to to um, uh, uh, work with these methods, there was the idea that we can run the whole process by using this type of of uh, methods and approaches. And uh, uh, now I think we are thinking more uh, uh, that we have uh, uh, work on long term processes, and there's a points of uh, process points of interaction where these type of uh, tools are extremely useful. But not in a way that uh, we could design uh, the whole uh, work based on this kind of uh, methodologies. And I think that that's a that's a that's a limitation and that's a lessons uh, learned uh, as well. And to be honest, in 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 worst case scenario, this leads to a very different direction. That uh, uh, if you uh, are using this in a wrong place in a wrong way. Um, as you have numbers, visualizations, people start to think that these are facts, even though they, they are opinions. <laughs> There's a tendency that when you give the number, you start to think that it's reality <laughs> or it's true, even though it would be just a different way to say your opinion. And I think that uh, always requires quite a lot of moderation when, when using these kind of uh, uh, tools. Thanks. Thanks, really good pointers. Uh, Edgar, if you wanted to add something. Yes, shortly, uh, to continue Ville's point. I mean, I always consider this kind of tools um, as an environment. I mean, one can use a, a hammer for something very useful and like for, uh, for, I don't know, for destroying everything. I mean, it depends on what is your purpose and like what is your goal and aim. And from, from my point of view, it always depends on individuals who are using that methodology. Yeah? For instance, you know, for instance, you can never, um, uh, it's like, for instance, uh, if you understand that the situation is very complex, it will very much depend on, on how inclusive your process is to be able to open that complexity of the situation. Otherwise you, you will, uh, underestimate some of the aspects, some of the factors that you have uh, in, in your very complex situation. So it's like, um, maybe it's my um, philosophy to be very human oriented. So, but, but still for me, uh, it's like very much depends on people who are using the methodology, not on the methodology, but on people. So, uh, and, um, it's important that it is used by right people. I mean, for right purposes, not, not uh, so it's always depends on what is your aim and what is your goal. So it's not limitation to the methodology, but it's, it's limitation to people who are going to use it. <laughs> no, it's excellent points. Thank, thank you so much, Edgar. And I think you're already taking us to the direction of the conversation I wanted to uh, dive into a little bit deeper is these kind of digital tools. We talked about foresight, but you can do, of course, foresight with or without digital tools. So when you are uh, using softwares like Incluse or some other, I mean, what are really the advantages, disadvantages? Like you're saying, you really need to think about what are you using it for? Uh, who are you using it with? 
In terms of the advantages, uh, I think Edgar, you already earlier you talked about you know the helpfulness of having to visualize um, participants' inputs back to them, and also to enable comparison uh, between positions. But then some of the disadvantages, I think Villa already mentioned this, that sometimes when you are digitalizing data, it becomes uh, you know as fact. It's easy, more easily read as facts. Do you have anything else to add on the advant advantages or disadvantages of the digital platforms in particular uh, in these conversations that we haven't covered yet? Villa, you can go ahead. Maybe I have a one point, uh, not so much on the uh, on the tools that we have now used, but uh, maybe potential on the on the digital tools more more broadly. Um, uh, we have had a lot of discussions with the different uh, companies, different experts on 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 what's the potential, uh, how we could benefit from from the uh, current developments of technology in in our work, and so on and so on. And I think that one one uh, 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 fundamental challenge which is there is that. I think most of the uh, digital platforms are based on the idea that you have a, a company or organization uh, who provides a platform and then you have a stakeholders who are using the platform and then uh, the company uh, uh, takes the data or organization takes the data and uses that for some purposes, for mostly on selling something to these people. Uh, but I think that our philosophy is that uh, uh, whatever is the data collected should be used by the stakeholders that have provided data for that collection process. And um, that's maybe a very difficult to model of, of actually uh, 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 people, people start to tend, tend to Many times when we are discussing on this kind of uh, uh, approaches, we end up on discussing on how we can collect data for some purposes. But I think we should discuss on how collectively we can collect data for the people who are using the data, uh, for, for the people who are participating. And that's maybe a, um, um, uh, that's something which is there in our approaches. But I think that uh, when looking at the next steps, and using the more sophisticated platforms, algorithms, and so on. That's many times the one of the fundamental points of, of, uh, of uh, uh, fundament, fundamental differences that we have in our work and uh, the uh, technologies available uh, currently uh, uh, elsewhere. Thanks. I think you're muted, Johanna. Oh, that's helpful. Thank you. <laughs> I have to do that once in a webinar. <laughs> uh, what I was trying to say is that we are soon moving on to questions from the audience. There are many and they are excellent. Uh, but before doing so, just any um, further reflections on the advantages or disadvantages or limitations on the digital tools by um, Andreas or Edgar. Andreas, you have a mic open, so go ahead. Yeah, well, maybe just one point uh, that hasn't come up yet, um, and that's related to um, the ability of these methods um, um, enabling remote uh, um, interventions. And that is something that has been discussed a lot in, in other fields, humanitarianism, uh, for, for instance. But I think it is also quite relevant for, for peace mediation. And obviously, during the pandemic, we've seen many of these tools uh, flourish, particularly because they they enable exactly that, uh, namely remote um, interventions. Um, but I think there is now after the pandemic, there is a bit of a risk that uh, for cost efficiency reasons, uh, organizations will uh, uh, try to do more work remotely. Now, um, there, I, th I think there are two concerns here that I'll just bring in. Uh, one is that, of course, with that, um, the question of kind of a meaningful and sustained uh, process uh, maybe comes into light a bit more. Um, if you're going in and out, do you really have a good um, 
or go, go in and out remotely? Do you really have a good sense of really what the process feels like? So I think um, um, that that's a risk. And the other one is, of course, uh, the risk of, you know, transferring uh, data um, uh, online from volatile, politically volatile contexts as well. Uh, I guess if mediators and dialogue facilitators are in place, they somehow share the risk uh, of you know ha having a dialogue that has political repercussions or might endanger participants and therefore there will be like you know risk assessments uh, in in place whereas i think when one does these things remotely there might be a bit more of an um, easy attitude towards that i'm not saying that that's something that i've seen but i'm just like saying that there's a at least a theoretical risk it's a very good example how certain characteristics like the ability to use these uh, tools remotely can be both an advantage, but also a disadvantage if you're not really carefully thinking through how you're doing and what are the associated risks. Um, Edgar, anything else to add? Well, one of the limitations that I see with these uh, tools is that uh, they are mostly aimed at working with um, quantitative data and they provide uh, a bit less space for working with uh, qualitative data. Uh, but at the same time, it, it helps you to produce qualitative data. It's like, uh, it's, it's very controversial. I mean, it may sound very controversial, but still one of the limitations is that still you need uh, quantitative data for being able to work uh, with, with that tools. Um, and um, yeah, and maybe, I mean, uh, it needs further improvement of working with more uh, qualitative data. I don't know how, I mean, you, you're going to do that, guys, but, but still, it will be very helpful, I mean, uh, from my point of view. Thank you. Um, really, I think we've gotten already far. We have still 15 minutes uh, left. So let's turn to the questions from the audience. I will start by a question um, that concerns the ways into aspects like gender, age, displacement status, and other identity markers and differences um, in risks are taken into consideration in implementing these tools. Um, so it's just understanding that the participants have various facets of identity that really kind of uh, come with different degrees of risks um, in, in per, per participation and providing input. So maybe you can all draw on your specific, Edgar, in the case of Armenia, start with that. How was this considered in the, uh, in the case that you participated? Yeah, it brings me back to, the, to my previous point. It, it always depends on people who are using the method and so on. It's so, so if you do your work uh, bearing in mind that you should create a group like uh, a gender sensitive group, be as inclusive as possible to involve like different segments of your society and that's it. And that will help you to get data with uh, considering all that diversity in your society. If not, tools will never help you in that. But this is my opinion. I mean, from my point of view, it very much depends on how you organize your process, not on tools, on, on methodologies, but on, on your philosophy, on your approach, on, on your uh, understanding of the world. I mean, I may sound very philosophical, <laughs> yeah, but, but this is like, these are my beliefs in, in organizing the work, the peace building work that we are doing. Andreas and Wille, how uh, does it make sense or alternative approaches? How do you think of it? Andreas? Yeah, sure. I mean, this uh, whole topic of, of inclusion and inclusivity, of, of course, uh, would uh, merit another uh, webinar. And a lot has been said and written about this over the past years as well. Um, but I, so I do think, of course, that, uh, you know, um, um, digital methods generally allow for much more nuance. Uh, in the assessment of different demographic uh, needs and, and 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 interests, and we've seen that, for instance, in the 
in the prioritization exercise that I've just uh, shared before, that one can, of course, then differentiate between um, the different demographies and, and, uh, and you know, contrast their interests, for instance, compare their interests and, and needs and assessments. Uh, the question, of course, does become, um, you know, what, who are the participants and how have they been selected? Uh, this is something that does not happen through digital methods uh, themselves, not even, and maybe we'll talk about that in a few minutes, not even if one was to use a kind of big data methods and artificial intelligence to to parse a larger um, uh, set of, uh, or a larger group of the population. Uh, there is still a, a risk of bias always. So selection is, is really keen. But I think what we are also seeing in CMI methods and in other methods is that going beyond just a kind of a broad concern with inclusion and broad-based participation, there is uh, an understanding that, um, you know, selecting who participates in a certain process has kind of strategic implications. So you will want to consult with or integrate spe specific population groups at certain times to achieve certain uh, objectives. Um, I think I've shared uh, another report in the chat, um, but I'm not sure if everyone can see it, but I'll, 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 um, I'll see that uh, again. Thanks. Now you're muted. Yeah. So, yeah, I I, I agree with uh, Andres that uh, uh, the digital uh, inclusion, how to say, would merit another <laughs> another discussion um, uh, fully. But uh, maybe one element which uh, which is there is that um, I think that indeed it 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 provides opportunity to to. Uh, 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 include the uh, actors who may would not be able to in, uh, uh, participate otherwise, uh, and I think that uh, uh, there's a lot of good experiences actually making a parallel consultations processes in different places, and when they are done in the same way with the, uh, some uh, digital um, uh, 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 digital marks, it's actually much easier to compare those. And at the end of the day, you you can uh, uh, you can how to say move forward with the separate consultations to the uh, uh, one joint project much easily uh, than without the uh, uh, the uh, uh, systematic uh, uh, systematic uh, consultations. So I think that's that's one uh, one uh, very clear uh, advantage. Uh, uh, but of course, I think that uh, like everywhere, uh, uh, in some cases, the uh, digital uh, tools are are good in including some uh, uh, segments of the society, but using only those might leave others out. So you always have to look at what's out and then use the other tools for other purposes. Thanks. And as in any um, efforts that aims at inclusion, the starting point is, I believe Andreas talked about the strategic purpose of inclusion. Who, are, who do you want to include and why? And then working backwards from there, what other methods uh, rather than choosing the methods first and then just looking at the um, kind of limitations and who can you reach. So I think that's, that's crucial. But as you said, all of you, is really the ability to compare uh, between different groups um, about their inputs and answers does exactly answer the question about what are the particular risks or particular um, characteristics of a certain identity facet. Another question, I think it's mainly... Um, addressed to Ville because it concerns CMI programming in particular. Uh, it is what has worked well and not that well within the cases, I guess, forward looking dialogue processes um, in regions such as Palestine, Yemen, Ukraine and the Horn of Africa. Um, so in CMI's work, uh, if there's any broader <laughs> uh, conclusions that you could share, and those are particularly also uh, areas where we have long-standing collaboration with the European Union on supporting these dialogue processes. So I believe that's part of the uh, yeah. where the question is coming from. So we let over to you. Yeah, I think that uh, uh, comparing these cases, I think that there's uh, upsides and downsides always. And actually, I'm not sure how much they are related to the context as such, and how much they they are related to the um, uh, uh, how to say broader uh, uh, broader concept. Uh, Concepts. For example, in Palestine, uh, we had a two-year uh, uh, project on on using uh, of the uh, where we use these methods quite uh, quite a lot, 
But the one distinct factor that that was a period of COVID and uh, two years of 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 a Zoom meetings and and uh, using different kind of digital tools, uh, uh, where um, where how to say, I think that the the COVID was much more important context than actually the um, uh, Palestinian uh, context. But of course, there, there was an interesting point that uh, uh, on one hand, I think that uh, 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 the Palestinians have used to work through the, uh, 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 through the different digital platforms and they are quite comfortable of having the discussions uh, on, on the different topics, but uh, uh, in the same way limit the certain topics out from the uh, <laughs> out from the digital sphere, and I would say that that was very visible in our work as well. That on one hand there was a lot of eagerness, a lot of uh, ability to work online, but you could see that some of the topics were fully out uh, from the discussion uh, 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 because of the of the digital sphere. And um, so I think that those are uh, those are always the cases. But I think this is the one. One interesting uh, example. The other example, uh, maybe Ukraine, and not only on Ukraine, but I think that in Ukraine there's a lot of uh, people who have used the use the social media a lot, and I think that um, uh, uh, there there's a totally uh, different kind of environment uh, of uh, of uh, uh, of, uh, of uh, uh, discussion in the social uh, social media sphere. Already before the the war started and and the period of fifteen to twenty where we were twenty two where we were active there as well, so I think that uh, not to answer fully on the question, but these are maybe uh, some insights from there. Thanks. It, it is indeed a rather big question, but I think some of those insights uh, serve as a response. Um, perhaps one of the final questions uh, again from the audience. A colleague who is very keen to explore the opportunity to create synthetic users and then use AI technology to put them in forward-looking scenarios to explore where they land and when prompted with various inputs. Um, any reflections that this prompts in you, um, the possibility of synthetic users and the use of AI in this regard? Andreas? Sure. I mean, this is a fascinating uh, question. I'm not sure if I like the sound of a synthetic uh, user, um, but uh, uh, obviously it is something that is happening. And I very often I think it's a good example for how uh, looking at uh, many of these um, innovations are coming from the private sector. And I think that's certainly something that comes from market research. Um, now, uh, I guess it, that, that asks about uh, the overall potential of uh, AI innovation and in, in, in fostering uh, future-oriented uh, methods. And, and um, certainly one uh, opportunity that I see here is that one can uh, obviously um, crunch much more data and probably integrate a, a representative um, set of the population. Um, so, uh, And certainly efforts here are already on the way experimenting with that. Um, now, there are uh, certainly limitations or, or, or challenges that emerge, um, uh, one being how to do so in a participatory manner. So obviously, uh, maybe the data collection that's done um, to then build these synthetic users or, you know, say, um, user profiles or population profiles uh, can be done in a, in a participatory way. But there's also a risk that one, for instance, uses other types of data, um, household survey data that's already there or, or social media data and therefore kind of bypasses um, um, the, the inclusion element of, of, of peacemaking. And I think that would be a bit weird uh, to try to, you know, uh, establish a user or population preferences without actually uh, consulting those who are affected by conflict. And I don't think it is a promising uh, approach. Um, and then the other the other question, of course, is as as we've discussed, you know, the the future orientation uh, is is something that is it's a, we're talking about attitudes here, about a posture that uh, conflict stakeholders and those affected by conflict have to adopt. Um, so just having a perfect recipe for peace based on you know uh, these synthetic users that one then can query, uh, for instance, is, is not necessarily doing doing the trick of of peacemaking. Uh, but it's interesting, and I'm looking forward to also uh, do more research on that in the, in the future. Great. We are coming almost to the end of our hour. Um, any, Edgar, if you wanted to react to this question about synthetic users? Um, as an exercise, as a, as a, as a try, 
I mean, I've been also interested in uh, outcome of, of, of such an uh, experiment. But again, I don't see any connection uh, with the processes on the ground, with what happens to real people on the ground. I mean, being part of a conflict affected uh, country, of a conflict affected uh, region, I'm always concerned about the real lives of people. So uh, I can um, I can try just as an exercise, as an example, to see you know what kind of trends uh, you can see, like what kind of uh, scenarios can be uh, seen, you know, but not as a as a real um, as an experiment that. That will. I mean, I don't know. I mean, I have to think about that. Actually, maybe there are some uh, brilliant ideas will pop up as a result of of such an experiment. I don't know. I mean, I'm interested. I mean, uh, I have a personal interest <laughs> to be part of such an experiment. I never tried it. <laughs> I think the the question related to AI and experience maybe brings us to the last question that I would like to pose to you. This is very briefly in 20, uh, 30 seconds each, because that's all we had. Just wanted to ask kind of like, what's next? What do you think should or could be developed next when it comes to these methods? Um, whether it be foresight, uh, futures thinking and or digital methods so that they could be even better be utilized to strengthen peacemaking. Um, so kind of the last words of challenge for the field, be it researchers, practitioners that you would like to put forward. Um, our last round, maybe starting with Andreas. And now you miss it. I was just about to answer a question in the chat. So I didn't catch what you were saying. My question was, what's next? Uh, what do you think should or could be developed next? what the peacemaking and also the research community should focus on if we think about how we can better use foresight and digital methods to serve and advance peacemaking. Yeah, thank you. I, I do think in short, it is it is the question of how to integrate uh, generative AI and LLMs in, in this kind of work. I think that is certainly going to be the, the next frontier. And I do actually think that CMI has a lot of potential really coming from the qualitative uh, side and shaping this this kind of process. Edgar, uh, what about your perspective? What's next or within Armenia, what you would like to do next? No, uh, for sure, I can say that I believe in uh, future thinking uh, approach. Uh, and I agree with Vila that it, it uh, creates a lot of opportunities to um, for creative thinking, for constructive thinking. So you do not stuck on, on the past and then you try to think like what kind of possibilities and what kind of opportunities you have. So I think um, in terms of uh, philosophy or approach, I mean, we will continue working like using that uh, approach, that uh, philosophy. Uh, when it comes to the digital tools, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm not a... Um, developer to, uh, so I mean uh, again I, I, I I'm rather a consumer of, of, of such technologies yes I mean uh, until certain degree we also try to use artificial intelligence for some I don't know uh, of, of like in some parts of our world uh, in of our work but still I, I have very little information on on how these tools, can help uh, our further uh, projects and our, our further processes. Um, yeah. Thank yes. you. And very last, Ville, in 10 seconds. Well, uh, I think that um, uh, referring to the earlier earlier point of, of uh, um, uh, uh, how to say, uh, users which are not real, I think that's not uh, not a good way actually to move forward. Uh, but I really see the potential of 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 AI in in starting to make a trials, as uh, Edgar uh, was saying, not uh, trying to influence on the real world uh, uh, because I think that that might cause uh, cause a challenges. But uh, uh, start to explore on 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 what could be the uh, instead of war games, what could be the peace games. Uh, uh, in the future and what we could learn from there and what kind of dynamics uh, we can create 
in that sphere that could be actually then transferred to reality in the future. But I would start first on the exploration and trials rather than uh, rather than immediately uh, put that on the on the real uh, 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 real world. Thanks. Very good. We are at the start of the year, so uh, I'm sure that these explorations and trials and continued development continues. From my side, I want to thank you all of our excellent, excellent panelists and also all of those in the audience uh, for your brilliant questions and for joining us today. Um, as noted in the beginning, this is part of the CMI Peace Talks live webinar series, so do keep an eye out on our social media channels for next iterations. I will end here. Uh, thank you for my part and wish you a very good rest of the day. Thank you. <laughs>